Let me invite you to open your Bibles to Daniel chapter 9. Now, I got some bad news. I had two people call in sick on me late last night. Mike Morley and Joe Easterling both called in sick. I think they're just being lazy. But it was like, if you wanted the time off, just ask. But both of them got sick. Mike got sick first, and he told me yesterday that, hey, he's not feeling well. And Brandy said he's not feeling well. For Mike not to be here, we probably need to take him to the hospital if he's that bad. Joe, on the other hand, <laughs> I'm kidding. Joe was supposed to start Revelation tonight. He has a high fever. We are not going to expose you to Joe tonight. Okay, so if you were planning on coming, thank you for your plan to come, but it's going to have to be postponed at least a week. And he was looking forward to me opening up Daniel chapter 9, uh, because this is the leapfrog passage that he would start from, but we'll be able to pick it up next week. Having said that, I want you to be aware of this. I am going to give you a panoramic view today of the end of time. I'm leaving the detail to Joe because there's no way for me to answer questions from the audience that I'm sure that you would have. There are mathematical calculations as to how I'm going to arrive at certain dates and things like that. I cannot address those on a Sunday morning. I don't have time to do that. I'm leaving it to Joe. So you're going to have to wait a little while to do that. Today I want you to know I am not preaching. I am teaching. There are some things I want you to know. There are some issues that I want you to be aware of, and I want you to grab them. So I'm really just trying to teach you something this morning, and I hope that you will give your attention to it so that I can really, really help out. I want, you, I want to ans answer the question today, again, as I've tried to answer each time. And here's the question that always is on my mind whenever I come to this time, and it is simply this. Is there any reason at all for us to believe that we could possibly be the terminal generation? That's the question. Because if not, if we're not that last generation, or if there's, no, if there's not even a reason for us to believe that we're that last generation, then why would I get you all hyped up? So we just have to ask, is there any reason? I want to give you some reasons this morning, some things for you to consider. I am not a date setter, and I cannot say definitively anything. So I want you to hear that from the very beginning. I'm not telling you this is when it's going to happen. I'm telling you there are some things that you ought to consider, some things that you ought to know, some things the Bible has written. The book of Daniel, this is the most famous eschatological passage in the Old Testament. Eschatology is a Greek, eschaton is a Greek word meaning last things. So when we talk about eschatology, it's the study of last things, not a big deal. This particular verse, or verses, Daniel chapter 9, verses 25, 26, and 27. We'll read a little more of that. But those three verses encompass the entirety of God's plan in three verses. The whole thing. So obviously they're completely cram full of stuff that I cannot deal with everything. So I'm going to give you this high 30,000 foot panoramic view that you're going to be okay with because you're going to be able to see some things. You need to ask yourself the question, in light of what I will share with you today, how should we be living? How should we be reaching our community? Where should we stand? What should our attitude be? I think that those things are important for us to recognize and understand. And also to examine yourself to find out, hey, am I, on the, am I in the faith? Is there something out there that I need to be aware of that I can do? And so please understand that. Um, I also feel like that for me to speak to you and try to get you to visualize in your head what I'm trying to say will be nearly impossible for you. So I've created a timeline for you to look at that will help you to pay attention. Before you pull out your cameras and your phones to take a picture, it's online. Okay, so you can get it where you want if you want it. It's not complete because if I filled that whole thing in, it would mess you up. So I've hit the highlights for you, okay? I'm trying to make this as easy as I possibly can for a Sunday morning. So would you read with me Daniel chapter 9, beginning in verse 20? And the reason I want to begin here is I've got to get you caught up. Got to get you knowing what's going on. Daniel 
is a prophet who is prophesying to Judah and Benjamin at this time while they're in captivity. They came in captivity under King Nebuchadnezzar, Belshazzar, Darius, Cyrus. They're kind of about 67 years in. Daniel is reading the book of Jeremiah. While he's reading the book of Jeremiah, he's like, wait a minute. I just recognized that God has told us how long he was going to keep us in captivity and that we're getting real close to getting released. And so that infamous passage of Scripture that all of us take and bend and mold and stretch and tear and rewrite to fit our circumstance, for I know the plans I have for you, says the Lord, not to destroy you but to give you a future and a hope, that has nothing to do with you. <laughs> that has everything to do with Israel. And it was what God told Israel prior to putting them in Babylonian captivity so that they would understand his goal was not to destroy them in this Babylonian captivity, but was to purify them. And he knew the plan that he had to get them out of that 70-year captivity, return them to the city of Jerusalem, restore the temple, restore the walls, restore the city, and launch them back out again as a people of God. I know the plans that I have for you, says the Lord. That's what he's talking about. And Daniel's reading that. In chapter 25, he reads, 70 years, these people were going to be in captivity. So as a result of that, he's like, God's going to let us out. Since God's going to let us out, I need to advocate for the people because the people are not advocating for themselves. So he begins to pray. He begins to confess the sins of the people, confess his own sins, confess our falters, faltering, where we haven't followed, why we're still not following, all the things we're still doing wrong. And then he asks God, he says, God, I'm not asking you because we're good people, and I'm not asking you because we're righteous. I'm asking you because you're righteous, and your name is at stake. I want you to do these things as a result of honoring your own name. And right in the middle of while Daniel is praying this prayer, the angel Gabriel is sent to him. And Gabriel says, God heard your prayer. I'm here to give you understanding. And so we're going to pick it up in verse 20. He says this, Now while I was speaking and praying and confessing my sin and the sin of my people Israel and presenting my supplication before the Lord my God for the holy mountain of my God, yes, while I was speaking in prayer, the man Gabriel, so Gabriel interrupts the prayer, whom I had seen in the vision at the beginning being caused to fly swiftly, reached me about the time of the evening offering. And he informed me and talked with me, and he said, O oh, Daniel, I have now come forth to give you skill to understand. At the beginning of your supplications, the command went out, and I have come to tell you, for you are greatly beloved. Therefore, consider the matter and understand the vision. Here's the vision. He says, Seventy weeks are determined for your people and for your holy city. And here's what those seventy weeks are for. To finish the transgression to make an end of sins, to make reconciliation for iniquity, to bring in everlasting righteousness, to seal up vision and prophecy, and to anoint the most holy. That's the purpose of these 70 weeks. He says, now, now that you know what God's going to do, know therefore, I'm going to give you the timing. I'm going to tell you when it's going to happen. He says, Know therefore and understand that from the going forth of the command to restore and build Jerusalem until Messiah the Prince, there shall be seven weeks and 62 weeks. So he says, I want you to know the start of this is going to be a command to restore Jerusalem. And there's going to be a period of time between that, that command and when the Messiah is killed so that you can know when all this stuff is going to happen. He says, the street will be built again and the wall, even in troublesome times. Verse 26, after the 62 weeks, Messiah will be cut off. In other words, he's going to die, but not for himself. And the people, here's a key phrase, and the people of the prince who is to come, who is to come, shall destroy the city and the sanctuary. The end of it shall be with a flood, and till the end of the war, desolations are determined. Then he shall confirm a covenant with many for one week, 
But in the middle of the week he shall bring an end to sacrifice and offering, and on the wing of abomination shall be one who makes desolate, even until the consummation, which is determined, is poured out on the desolate. Would you pray with me? Father, as we come to your prophets, the prophet Daniel specifically, I thank you for these things that were written thousands of years ago and that they come upon us today. You told Daniel he was to seal up the prophecy because it was for a later time. It was for a later day. As a matter of fact, it was for the last days. And that the end time generation would come to understand it. He marked that end time generation with an elevated and exponential increase in knowledge and also the travel mobility of the final generations. As we consider these things and we look to our own generation, we have to kind of formulate today whether or not we believe that we might be close. Obviously, we're closer because time has passed, but how close are we? Let us never be date setters or trend setters, but we should be able to read the times and the seasons. And it is my responsibility to share what you said, and we will trust, Father, that by your Holy Spirit, you will lead others to determine what they should take away from these teachings. I give you praise for this, and I ask that if there's anybody here today that doesn't know Jesus, what an incredible day to be saved. We give you praise for it in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay. You ready? Here's what I want to do. Like I said, I just want to teach you this morning. I want to give you information so that you're not waiting for me to give you information. I want you to know where I'm going. Today is a day about dates. It's interesting whenever Daniel was asking this angel, asking God, hey, I've got some questions that I want to know, uh, that God gave him a calendar, a timeline, an event type situation, and it, rather than just a long narrative. And he did it very compactly in three verses. There's some dates that I want to address, and I'm, I'm just going to put them in front of you right now so that you'll already have them. Don't panic about writing it down. All this stuff is online. And if you want to write it down, some of you have to. You have to. You cannot help it. <laughs> and I get it. Please write them down. Here's some significant dates. And, and when you, where do we get these dates from? Look, the Bible has different month, names of months than we have. And so we have to jump across from the biblical calendar to the Gregorian calendar. We have to adjust for the fact that a biblical calendar year is 360 days. The Gregorian calendar year is 365.257893 days. And so that, and we have to, you know, we got to toss in uh, a leap year every four years to make up for that little quarter of a day that gets messed up. We have to adjust every year. So we've got to make those calculations. They're very long calculations to be able to do. And there's more than a Gregorian calendar out there. There's lunar calendars. There are solar calendars. And so, you know, try not to get involved in all that. I have translated these dates over to our calendar so as not to confuse you. Because I don't know that you care about what the month of Nisan is or even know what month that is. Okay? So bear with me. The first date I'm going to talk about is July 23rd, 537 B.C. This is the date of the Babylonian decree. I'll explain it. The second date is April the 6th, 32 A.D., which is the date of Jesus' triumphal entry into Jerusalem on the week prior to his crucifixion. A.D. 70 is the year that the city of Jerusalem was ransacked by Titus, the Roman conqueror. The city was destroyed. The walls were destroyed. The temple was destroyed. And Israel ceased being a nation on that year. May 14, 1948, a name that is in our regular calendar that we're fully aware of, is the date that the nation of Israel was reestablished as a nation. Hasn't been that long ago. June 7, 1967, is the date of the reunification of Jerusalem as the capital city of Israel. And then a 70-year period is the length of life that God gave people, three score and ten, or a generation. We're not using the typical generational 30 years because that's not what God said. But He gave the lifespan of people that are out there. So we need to deal with that. Those are dates that I'm going to talk about so that you're not caught off guard by those dates. And you can see that they're separated by a number of different things. So as Daniel is praying, and he recognizes they're about three years away from release, Daniel prays, and he asks God over the course of his prayer in Daniel chapter 9, three major questions. Because here they are in Babylon. 
which is modern day Iraq. They want to go back to Jerusalem. And so he's like, we don't know anything about Jerusalem. So he asked three questions. You can find them in the text. We're just going to move past this pretty quickly. He basically says this. What is the fate of Jerusalem, God? Tell me about that. Number two, what is the fate of the Temple Mount? Because it was all destroyed. What about that? And number three, what is the fate of my people? We've kind of, and, and why would you ask that question? We have to realize that there was a divided kingdom. There were 10 tribes over here, and there were two tribes over here. Judah and Benjamin are the only two tribes left that we're aware of. The other 10 have been lost. And at that time, uh, those other 10 had kind of, they were known as Israel, Israel and Judah, because they separated. And so he's like, hey, we know where we're at. What about the rest of our people? What about the other 10 tribes? What about my brothers and their families? What about them? How, how are we going to be? And so he's asking that question. In reference to that question, the angel comes back and said, let me answer what God has to say. And instead of answering very specifically about that, the angel Gabriel gives him the panoramic overview of God finishing everything on planet Earth. And he gives him six things that he wants to tell him. Number one, he says, 70 weeks are determined upon your people. So in other words, he says, I want you to know that there's a period of 70 weeks. Now, weeks as we know it are not what he said here. The word is Shabua or Shebuim, and it simply means seven. In the, in the Hebrew language, they would have understood this to be seven years because that's how their whole thing operated, seven years and on multiples of seven years. And the Jubilee, 50 years after seven sevens of 49 years, the 50th year was the year of Jubilee. That they would have fully understood what he was talking about. So what he literally says is there are 70 sevens that are out there, or 490 years that are determined upon your people. And they're here to do six things. Number one, they're here to finish the transgression. In other words, when man rebelled against mankind, God's going to end it. He's going to bring it to a culmination. And there won't be any more rebellion. He's going to end it. Number two, he's going to put an end to sin. Not only is there not going to be rebellion, but God is going to take care of this sin, and we're all going to be realigned with the values that God put out there in the first place, and we're going to live that way. And for those who don't, they're going to be in a different spot. Number three, he's going to atone for the wickedness. That means he's going to bring us back to that one place with God. He did that through Jesus Christ, through his crucifixion. Number four, he's going to bring in everlasting righteousness, which simply means that we are going to live aligned with God's plan for good. He's going to make that happen. Number five is to seal up the vision and the prophecy, which means he's going to authenticate everything that God ever wrote in the book. He's going to bring it to pass. You might remember there were times that Jesus said, I promise you, for those of you who believe in me, though you're going to suffer much persecution, much criticism by the world, there's coming a day where you will not be ashamed. You will not, because I'm going to make sure that everybody understands that what I said is what it is. That's why I entitled this whole entire series, According to Plan, because God's already laid this plan out. And he says to, number six is to anoint the most holy, which means not Jesus. He's already anointed, talking about the millennial temple where worship is going to take place, that they're going to reestablish that. And they're going to reanoint that, and that's going to be the center of worship in the whole world. It's going to take 490 years for all this stuff to happen. So after the angel says, hey, Daniel, I want you to know that these 490 years have been determined upon your people and your city. So this whole situation is all about the Jewish nation, and it's about the city of Jerusalem. It's not about the land of Israel. It's about the city of Jerusalem and the people of Israel. And he says, this is what's going to happen. So then here's what he does. He wants to give him a timeline in order to do it. Jesus said in, in Matthew chapter 24, which is the passage I've already been in a little bit. But Matthew 24 is one of the premier passages in the Gospels where Jesus talks about the end time because the people are asking him. And so as they ask, when is this stuff going to happen? Here's what Jesus said. He said in verse 15 of 24, Therefore, when you see the abomination of desolation spoken of by Daniel the prophet standing in the holy place. So if you want to know when all this stuff is going to happen, he was talking about some other things in Matthew 24. He said, just look for what the prophet Daniel said. So Jesus confirmed the vision of Daniel. He confirmed the validity of the vision of Daniel by declaring that what Daniel said is actually going to take place. In today's modern-day religious world, because religion is not full of believers, it's full of religious people. 
The true church is full of believers. You know, that those of us who just happen to believe what he said is true. I never question God. I'm not that dumb. You know what I mean? God questions me. I merely try to speak for him. So here's what I'm going to do. I felt like that if I tried to get you all to hold this in your head, it wouldn't make it. So we're going to put a timeline on the screen behind me, and we're going to leave it up. Because I know sometimes we put it up and snatch it away real quick. And I see some of y'all having anxiety attacks out there. I didn't finish. <laughs> so we're going to put it up. Put that thing up there. Here's the timeline, nice and colorful, so that y'all won't be worried about the black and white. And then let me walk you through this timeline. Okay? Let me walk you through the timeline so you can understand what's going on. You'll notice that the dates that I gave you are on this timeline because I want you to see how it happens. Here is Daniel, and he is asking the question, uh, when is this stuff going to happen? When is all this stuff going to take place? And so God says, hey, 77s are determined upon you. And so here, here's how I want you to see. If you look at this timeline, you'll see right over here, this first part, you'll see verse 25. Encompassing that first part are the teachings of verse 25. That is from the time of Daniel all the way up until the time of Jesus. Verse 26, he says, after these things, he doesn't put it in the seventh, 70th week, and he doesn't put it in the first 69 weeks. He said 70 and 62 equals 69. After that, this happens. And so these things happen in a space and time, and then he says, after that, there's going to be, verse 27, a 70th week, there's going to be a covenant of 1-7, and he's going to put it right there. Now, there's some controversy over this, believe it or not, in the, in the scriptural world, in the religious world, about when do these things take place. Um, I'm just, in case you wonder who I am, I'm a believer, I believe what God said, that's how I'm teaching it. There's a spectrum of so-called believers when they look at Scripture. There are those who want to allegorize Scripture. In other words, they give it all kinds of whacked-out meanings, and then there are those who just simply believe it's true. I'm all the way over here. It's true. That's what I'm going to tell you. We don't allegorize. We just tell you exactly what it says. And your interpretive message will tell you how believing you are, not conservative, liberal, believing and unbelieving. Man, if you can just change something any way you want to, then you can change everything. I don't want to do that. I don't think that it's right to change the meaning of something for my convenience. For example, let me just give you a thought on one. An assault rifle is not available to the public. It's available to the military. Therefore, I would be a liar and a deceitful person if I identified a non-assault rifle as an assault rifle. I would be a liar. I wouldn't want to do that as a way of manipulating for political purposes. Just a thought. You know, <laughs> sometimes I wish I could lie to y'all and get you to believe this quickly as others lie. Sometimes I just like making y'all mad <laughs> or whoever's watching. Anyway, so there's, uh, there's days out there. Let's go, to the first, let's go to this first date, July 23rd, 537 B.C., the Babylonian Decree. What is going on there? Because in verse 25, the Bible says, Know therefore this is what, what's going to happen from the start of this decree. From the time when it was like rebuild the, the city of Jerusalem, this is when this thing starts. So then we have to decide when does it start. And how many, there were three decrees, and we've got to pick which the decrees are. We have a, a priest named Ezra. And there's a book called Ezra where God gave a decree and allowed, under King Cyrus, he allowed the people to return to the city, but their major focus was rebuilding the temple. It was not a decree to rebuild the city of Jerusalem. However, it is a significant date, and that happens to be July 23rd, 537, 
which was the decree of King Cyrus, to release the people to return to the city if they wanted to. What we learn from, from Ezra in the book of Ezra is that a handful of people went back. It was a very disappointing return from the people because the temple was gone, the city was ruined, it was all destroyed. There was a magnificent temple there previous. When they tore it down, Ezra rebuilt a temple but the temple was very small. It had one table of showbread. It had one golden lampstand. It had one altar. It had one uh, place to sack. So it was really teeny tiny. And the people were real bothered by it. The, uh, the prophet Haggai came in to tell the people, y'all, let, let me tell you why that temple's so small, because y'all keep building up your own homes and you're ignoring the house of God. And God's not real happy about that. And he's taking your money because you won't take care of his own house. And so we have that decree right there, but it's a significant decree, but it's not the decree that Daniel's talking about. The decree that Daniel is talking about took place on uh, March the 14th of 445 B.C. whenever Nebuchadnezzar, not Nebuchadnezzar, uh, King Artaxerxes was confronted by Nehemiah. You might remember in the book of Nehemiah, Nehemiah had a brother, his name was Hanani, and he had been in Jerusalem. Hanani came to visit Nehemiah was the king's cupbearer, and Nehemiah is talking. He says, hey, how are things back at the home place? He says, oh, it's horrible. It's horrible. Uh, the walls are torn down. The gates are burned with fire, and the place is in total rubble. And then Nehemiah got convicted and said, man, I want to go back. He was the king's cupbearer, so if he ever balked at all, he, in other words, he's the guy tasting the food for the king to make sure the king doesn't get poisoned. If he had any kind of issue he would just automatically die because they know there was a coup and your cupbearer is closest to you and he would die. That's not what happened. God spared, King, uh, spared Nehemiah. Artaxerxes, he, he said, why are you so sad? He said, I'm sad because the city's destroyed. My people are destroyed and that's not right. I want to go back. And so Nehemiah uh, convinced King Artaxerxes to make a decree to let them go back and build, rebuild the city. And we know that Nehemiah rebuilt the walls around the city in 52 days the temple was there, the city walls were back, and they repopulated the city, and that was the decree. So starting from March 14th, 445 B.C., to rebuild the city of Jerusalem, these 77s begin. The 490 years begin. So it starts. Now, he encapsulates two time frames in there, one seven and 62 sevens. And so we have that right there in verse 25. One seven and 62 sevens, which is 69 sevens or 69 weeks. And he says, in this time that they're going to be, that they're going to rebuild the city, they're going to rebuild the walls, but it's going to be in troublesome times. And it was in troublesome times because that was during the time whenever we saw Alexander the Great rise up and we also saw the Roman, the nation of Rome rise up. And it was a horrific time of wars and battles and rumors of wars and all kinds of stuff that were going on. And ultimately, the nation of Israel came under Roman occupation, and they were still there. And he says, now, for these 69 weeks, which is, we translate that into days, uh, that would be 173,880 days in a 360-day year. Then we come down to this date, April 6 of 32 A.D. And he says... He told us, seven, one seven, sixty-two sevens, till Messiah, the Prince. April 6, 32 A.D., to the day, Jesus rode into Jerusalem on a donkey and declared himself to be the Messiah who was to come on that day. So we have precisely to that day Jesus riding into Jerusalem. You might remember if you go back and you study the words of Jesus, he looks over the city and he looks over them with compassion and he's bothered because he makes this statement, if you would have known what this day was, the day of your visitation. In other words, Jesus knew what God knew, that God had planned out the time. He gave very specific markers for the time, and then he was there. And he told everybody there, he says, you guys should be worshiping me because if you don't, even the rocks are going to do this. And so we have that time. And then in verse 26, he says this, after that period of time, which means 
The thing that's going to happen afterwards is not going to happen within those first 69 weeks or 483 years. It's not going to happen in that time. It's going to happen after that time. It's not going to happen in the final week. It's going to happen in between the final week. He says, after those times, Messiah will be cut off. Four days later, on April 10th of 32 AD, Jesus was crucified. And then after that, in AD 70, some 48 years later, or 38 years later, we have the city of Jerusalem under siege by the Roman conquerors, Titus, and he comes in and he conquers the city, tears down the walls, destroys, burns the temple, flips the temple over, takes down every single stone as Jesus once predicted in that time frame. And now we haven't seen that final seventieth week. The big controversy within religious circles is, well, if God pronounced 70 weeks, then these things should be continuous, and so it's already done, it's already over. Well, the question you have to ask yourself, if you had, you know, some sort of logic to you, you'd have to ask yourself, has sin been completely dealt with? Is sin completely over? Is everybody living completely righteous? Has the millennial temple been established? None of this stuff has been done. It hasn't been done yet, so obviously we're not here yet. And there are people that question whether or not this could be. And that's why you have this timeline, because there's an interval there. And some people don't believe in that interval. I totally get that. But I, I want to help you uh, to understand how this interval could be. When Jesus came in, and he, he, one day he's in his own city of Nazareth. And he is trying to, descri to describe to people who he is in his own city. And, of course, we understand that they did not accept Jesus in his city. He said, the prophet is not without honor except in his own country. So the only place that people don't believe in you is whenever you're, is your home folks. And Jesus walks into the synagogue one day. He asks for a scroll. They give him the scroll of Isaiah. He opens up the scroll of Isaiah. He reads a passage, rolls it back up, and then declares it has been fulfilled. Let me read that passage to you because I want to show you something very particular about how Jesus interprets history. Luke chapter 4, verse 17 through 21, it says this. He was handed the book of the prophet Isaiah, and when he opened the book, he found the place in where it was written, Verse 18, the Spirit of the Lord is upon me because he has anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor. He has sent me to heal the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to the captives and recovery of sight to the blind, to set at liberty those who are oppressed, to proclaim the acceptable year of the Lord. Then he closed the book, gave it back to the attendant and sat down. And the eyes of all who were in the synagogue were fixed on him. And he began to say to them, today, this scripture is fulfilled in your hearing. Well, to understand what Jesus did, we need to go now to Isaiah, the scroll that he opened, and read the actual passage and see if Jesus had any problem with the pause. It's Isaiah 61, verses 1 through 3. So listen to what he said. Remember, the last word that Jesus said in verse 19 of Luke 4 was to proclaim the acceptable year of the Lord. Listen to what it says in Isaiah 61. The Spirit of the Lord God is upon me because he has anointed me to preach good tidings to the poor, he has sent me to heal the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to the captives, and the opening of the prison to those who are bound, to proclaim the acceptable year of the Lord, comma. Not a period, a comma. He says, and the day of vengeance of our God, to comfort all who mourn, to console those who mourn in Zion, to give them beauty for ashes, the oil of joy for mourning, the garment of praise for the spirit of heaviness, that they may be called the trees of righteousness, the planting of the Lord, that he may be glorified. Jesus closed the scroll up in the middle of the scroll because he hadn't come to do the other part yet. He simply had come to do this part. This part of coming, being sacrificed, crucified, resurrected. And he knew that there was another point coming that was going to be that 70th week, but he hasn't accomplished that yet. So verse 27 gives us the start of this 70th week of Daniel. How do we know when it's going to be? Here, here's what we do know. We know exactly what's going to happen because in the book of Revelation, chapter 6 through chapter 19, is the full expanded detail of this final week. The 70th week of Daniel is outlined in chapter 6 through chapter 19 of the book of Revelation. Joe will help you understand all those details. It has a lot of stuff in there. It's got some vials. It's got some bowls. It's got some horses. It's got some plagues. It's got a lot of stuff that's going to go on during this week. 
So we have a lot of detail about what that week is going to be like. The bigger question is, do we have any idea when this week is going to happen? Because there is clearly an interval, a gap that is in between there. And I don't think that it's even questionable that that gap could be there, though plenty question it. How do we know? Did God tell us anything else? Well, if you only look to the prophet Daniel, you're going to be challenged to find out how long this gap lasts. And then here comes, uh, do we have any reason to believe that we might be close? Well, I think that we have to go back to the book of Ezekiel again and find out what the prophet Ezekiel says. I'm not going to put the scriptures on the board, but they're in the book of Ezekiel where God is talking to the nation of Israel and Ezekiel and Daniel are both prophets living during the time that the nation is in captivity. They're both prophesying to Judah and Benjamin in the captivity and they're telling them what's going on and what's going to happen to them in the captivity. Daniel is the one seeing visions about the future. Ezekiel is seeing visions a little bit about the future, but also about the behavior of the nation of Israel while they're in captivity and how they still haven't learned anything. What a challenge of these people. And so God tells Ezekiel to tell the people how long this stuff is going to last. And he basically says, hey, I want you to know that this stuff here is going to last for these 490 years. And then Ezekiel, he says, Ezekiel, I want you to illustrate in real life and in real time what I'm going to do to these people in light of this 490 years if they don't listen to me. So in Leviticus chapter 26, he reminds us of a prophecy that God gave, and he said, when you guys go into captivity, if you don't listen, I'm going to multiply your punishment times seven. So they weren't listening. He said, Ezekiel, here's what I want you to do. I want you to give them a timing, and I want you to go, go out into the middle of the city, and I want you to lay on your side for a certain number of days. However many days that is, each day will represent a year. Once you're done laying on your left side, I want you to lay on your right side. And however many days you lay on your right side is going to be equal how many years that we're going to add on to that for the various things that they were doing wrong. So Ezekiel went out into the middle of the city and literally laid on his side for 390 days. And then he laid on his other side for 40 days. Now, can you imagine coming out and like, have y'all seen the dude that's laying on his side out there? What is he doing? So it was, it was in the minds of the people what he was doing. Seventy years of that captivity were burned up in the Babylonian captivity, but there were still time left and then multiplied it by seven times. If you multiply that time, like God said in Leviticus 26, times seven, you'll come up with 2,520 years from July 23rd, 537 B.C., because that began the time of the Gentiles when they went in, uh, or ended the time when they were able to come out. 2,520 years. If you multiply the days and you do the math, you will come to May 14th, 1948. In other words, God says, you're gonna, I'm, I'm requiring you to have servitude for me for all these sins you've committed. And if you're not going to change, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to multiply it times seven. He did. When you multiply it times seven, you come to May 14th, 1948, which is when Israel was regathered and reestablished as a nation. Now, let me tell you why that's significant. It has never happened in the past. It will never happen in the future. There has never been in human history, recorded human history, a nation that was there, destroyed, and came back. It is absolutely a bona fide historical miracle that they came back as a nation. It has never, ever happened before, exactly according to plan. Let me tell you what Jesus said. Jesus had some other things to say. In Matthew chapter 24, when they were asking Jesus about this whole time of coming back, he, they're like, is there a time? When is it going to happen? We want to know when it's going to happen. So Jesus said, learn the parable of the fig tree. 
He said, when its branch has already become tender and puts forth leaves, you know that summer's near. Now we're agriculturalists, and so we're not. But when your grass starts to turn green, you know that winter's ending and summer's coming, right? You kind of know that. So he says, so also when you see all these things that he has just expressed in Matthew 24, know that it is near at the doors. So he's like, I want you to know how close this is. It's not just near, it's at the doors. Assuredly, I say to you, this generation will by no means pass away until all these things take place. Heaven and earth will pass away, but my words will by no means pass away. And so he says, he wasn't talking about the generation he was talking to. He says, when this stuff happens, the generation that starts then will not pass away before the end of these things. Now, a generation is about 30 years, but he wasn't talking about a generation. He was talking about a lifespan. So if we use 70 years as a lifespan, he's not talking about May 14th, 1948, but he's talking about because it wasn't about them coming back and being reestablished as a nation. The prophecy in Daniel 9 says this is about your people and the city of Jerusalem. So we've got to stay with the city of Jerusalem and understand this. The city of Jerusalem was divided as a divided capital way back at the division of the kingdom, back in the Old Testament, you might remember, Israel, Judah, right? And they had different kings. Judah usually had the righteous kings. Uh, the nation of Israel used, or Israel usually had the unrighteous kings. They went a long way until they were completely disbanded. June 7th, 1967, Jerusalem was reunified as the single capital of Israel. And the clock started. If you add 70 years to that, because he said they're not going to die before this is all over, if you add 70 years to that, what does that come to? 20, 37? Is that right? Does that mean that's when it's going to happen? Here's what I'm telling you. Things that God said were going to happen happened in our day. March 14th, 1948. If you read Ezekiel and the vision of the dry bones, you'll discover that God talked about the recollection of the nation of Israel. They're scattered everywhere. He was going to start bringing them back. He's going to start bringing them back. Hitler did everything he could. Hitler was a studier. He did everything he could to make sure that Israel would never be regathered tried to exterminate them. Didn't work. It didn't work. They're back to the same strength and higher than they were before Hitler got there. And Hitler seemed to spark it on to make it happen even more. And so it happened in our day. And then in 1967, unbelievable situation in 1967. No one would have ever predicted this in 1967. No one predicted 1948. In fact, if you go back and read what happened in 1948, you'll discover that Israel was brought to the brink of nothing and somehow, some weird, strange, impossible way, Israel won the war, became a nation. It's not even possible that it could happen, and it did. And the reunification of that, na of that capital happened in 1967. And so two things have happened very, very clearly in our day that were prophesied by God according to His Word. And if you had 70 years to that, uh, you'll recognize, or you had years to, from, from that date, you'll recognize that it hit June 7th, boom, on the day as well. Kind of freaky how accurate the Scripture is. Are we close? You decide. You decide. I think we are. Here's the good news. I ain't hanging out for it. Not planning on hanging out for it. Not going to hang out for it. There's this thing called the rapture that is going to be coming. A lot of questions about the rapture. What's that all about? I'm going to start telling you about the rapture in a couple of weeks. I need to let one more thing to come out there that you understand is coming prior to the rapture. Before that rapture comes, you need to know what that is, and then I'll talk about it, show you the difference between the rapture and the second coming, what all that looks like, and some of the timelines that run through this whole situation. And Joe's going to be inundated with tons of questions. We'll let him answer the questions, okay? But I'll give you as much as I possibly can. Here's what I know. Hey, guys, I think we're on the brink. I really do. 
It encourages me because all the noise that's going on out there in the world, it doesn't really bother me a whole lot because here's what I know. God says, hey, 70 years were determined upon the people of Israel and that holy city, and that's all that God's worried about. Everything else is going to flood in behind it. And he said, here's what's going to happen during that time. And we saw three of those things that were fulfilled for you. still got to go yet. There's coming a day where everybody that disagrees with God is going to agree with him. Everybody that thumbs their nose at God is going to bow their knee to him. The Bible tells me that everybody that ever criticized me, sent me a bad letter, bad email, told me I was wrong, is one day, listen, one day, according to Scripture, according to the book of Revelation, is one day going to come and bow before me and you and declare to us we were right. That day's coming. I'm good. I'm good. There's a lot of stuff that's going to happen in that seven-year period of time because the Bible says, and here's what, here, I don't want you to mistake this, so many believe that the rapture signifies the beginning of that 70th week. It does not. It does not. Look in verse 27. Verse 27 tells us that this Antichrist is going to establish a covenant with the people of Israel for one week. It is the signing of the covenant between the Antichrist and the nation of Israel that begins the tribulation period. Where does the rapture fit in that? Previous. How soon previous? I don't know. It doesn't say. But we will be raptured out of here first, and then something's going to... I think that we have to get out in order to create a situation where that Antichrist can rise up and take over because he's not going to be able to do it with us here. That's pretty obvious. For example, uh, I don't I think I told you this last week, but all 15 amendments that were going to cede away the sovereignty of the United States over the WHO were all defeated. So we're still sovereign for now. Praise the Lord. This day is coming. So, hey, how should you live? How should you live? Well, I hope that you'll live holy and righteous and fair and loving and all that kind of stuff. But the first thing you need to do, you need to get saved. If you're not saved, I'll, I'll, I'll tell you this in the future, but I'll just, it, the Bible says for those who have had the opportunity to hear the gospel and don't accept it, and the rapture comes. God himself, not the devil, God himself will send you strong delusions so that you will continue to believe the lie so that you will never accept the gospel for rejecting it when he offered it. In case you ever wondered about this God, he's like, I am not going to take somebody rejecting my gospel over and over and over again, only all of a sudden when times get bad, uh, we want him now. He's like, no, nope, that's not going to happen. That is not going to happen. So why don't you just do it now? It'd be a whole lot easier. A whole lot easier. You're like, I don't think I can live up to it. Hey, can anybody raise their hand who has lived up to the gospel? Anybody at all? Because let me put mine down. I'm a sinner under the blood of Jesus making it day by day, sometimes passing, sometimes failing. So if you think you can't handle all the requirements, join the crowd. Just join in with us. Join in. You're like, well, there's all hypocrites in the church. You finally figured it out. <laughs> you figured it out. We're all hypocrites, and we are saved by grace. I'd rather be a hypocrite saved by grace than a hypocrite on my way to hell. I mean, if I got to choose one, that's what I'm going to choose. So if you're in hell and I'm in heaven, you're like, yeah, but he's a hypocrite. Yeah, but I'm a saved hypocrite. I'm <laughs> under the blood. Y'all stand with me. Let me pray you out of here. Father, I thank you for this day. If there's any, any at all that need Jesus, need to be saved today, I pray that they'll come. There's folks down here to help them. For the rest of us, if, there, if we have the ability to hang out for lunch today, what a blessing it would be to our young people to be able to serve us. We can help them to train. We can put our money where our mouth is whenever we say, boy, the young people, they really need to grow. Here's our opportunity to do something significant about it. Some can stay, some can't. There is no problem if they can't. And we don't want to use guilt. I just uh, put it out there. It's an opportunity. Father, the greatest opportunity today is for a person to come to faith in Christ. And there'll be folks right here at the front. I hope they'll come. For the remainder of us, Lord, give us an awesome day. We love you for it. We thank you and give this day to you in Jesus' name. Amen.
God bless you all. You're dismissed. Look forward to seeing you next Sunday.